we have Kent Ritter on the call. Kent, really appreciate your time here today. And uh, Kent, we don't really get a lot of opportunity to talk to multifamily investors because a lot of the people that listen to my show are getting into real estate investing for that first time. And uh, we spend a lot of time regarding wholesaling and buying single family houses and finding, finding those discounted deals. But we need multifamily investing is always an aspirational step for a lot of investors that I've sure. found and, and uh, really wanted to spend some time on this topic here today. But before we do, Kent has a podcast of his own, and I really want everybody to check it out. So definitely check out Ritter on real estate. And you all can also find him on the web at Kent Ritter. That's R I T T E R.com. Well, I really appreciate your time here, Kent. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on, Jack. This is uh, this is awesome. I'm glad to be here today. And and yeah, you, you mentioned the podcast. And, and so folks that are aspirational multifamily investors, I mean, that's really what my podcast is, is, is trying to be a resource that I didn't have when I was coming up in multifamily. To, it's uh, all about helping people make better investing decisions. So so hopefully it can help some people move from aspirational and, and move into reality. That's that's the goal. So how did you get into real estate investing? I know you in, you've landed in multifamily, um, mm -hmm. but uh, usually that's not where people typically start off. So uh, yeah, where did you start? Yeah, same with me. I didn't start in multifamily. Uh, just real quick background. So I, I sold a business at the end of 2015, and that really kicked off my real estate journey as I was and I was saying, okay, what next? And, and where do I, how do I want to, um, you know, continue to build, build wealth. And I, I didn't want to put all the money that I gained into the stock market and have all my eggs sitting in one basket. So I really looked at different avenues and started out looking at a, dot, a lot of different investment strategies and, and really landed on real estate, saw a lot of value there. And uh, the first thing I did was I actually started uh, selling houses on contract and, uh, you know, creating a note portfolio. And so I, I did that because I had a family friend who, who, who was executing that strategy. So it's kind of like, you know, I, I want to learn about real estate. It was, uh, you know, Hey, well, I know this guy who's doing something. So I started talking with him mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that was really the first foray and, you know, Having a, a debt portfolio is is all is all well and good, and there's a lot of there's a lot of pros to it. The the con that that I realized was well, about a year later, one of those houses that I had the financing on sold, and because I had the financing, you know, you get the HUD statement. Took a look at it, that house had doubled in value, and I said, "Wow!" So <laughs> this guy just doubled his value, but all I'm doing is getting my loan paid back. I said, man, I want to be on the other side of that. I want to own these assets. And that's when I started looking at, you know, instead of debt, focusing on equity. Sure. You know, one of the things that I think is interesting is that, uh, and I'm, I'm going to almost predict what you might answer here, but looking back on it now, do you wish you would have gotten into multifamily sooner? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I fell in love with multifamily when I really started to understand multifamily, you know, when I, so when I was thinking about, okay, I want to invest in real estate because I want to diversify. Right. And I don't want all my eggs in one basket. Um, you know, really when I, when I first thought of real estate, all I, all I'd ever been exposed to was kind of the single family rental landlord that mm -hmm. anyone I know that invests in real estate, that's how they invested in real estate. They owned a single family or two and they were landlords. So that was all I really knew. So that's what I, that's what I thought of real estate investing was. And then, then I learned about, you know, note, note investing. And okay, that was a new piece of it, but I still, at that point, didn't know really about multifamily. I guess I really thought that, you know, who owns these big apartments, probably big corporations, mm -hmm. right? Um, I didn't realize that, that you could, that a lot of these apartments are owned by individuals or by groups of individuals that pull their money together. And so when I learned that, that was just eye-opening for me. I said, wow, I can go out and purchase these large assets, these, what I view them as really cash flowing businesses. And, um, and there's a lot of reasons in my eyes why, why that's better than a single family 
approach. Now, don't get me wrong. I have some single families as well. I have some duplexes and things because there's, there's nothing wrong with multiple streams of income, but I just really feel like you can't beat multifamily. What are some of those like misconceptions then if people are, are getting into real estate investing that they, they might, uh, yeah, I call them misconceptions because I, I think sometimes people are the, under the uh, wrong impression that it takes more to get into real, to a multifamily than a single family home. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, I think it just seems more complicated, right? It's everything's bigger. Mm. Right. And, and, and that can be intimidating. I think, I think people are comfortable with a single family home because a lot of people, they live in single family homes. They've purchased the single family home. They know how the process works. Mm. Right. And in reality, purchasing a, I mean, purchasing a 400 unit multifamily property is not all that different than purchasing a single family home from the fact that you, you get debt, you know, you get debt, you put 20% down or maybe 25 or 30% down. Um, you, you go through a title company for the purchase, you know, the per- the actual purchase assigned the paperwork feels very similar. Um, mm-hmm. I just think it's, it, it's probably like me, there's just kind of this, this initial uh, intimidation or what I would call limiting beliefs, perhaps, you know, mm-hmm. I, I had to overcome a lot of limiting beliefs that I had uh, to be able to, to think that, man, who am I to do this, right? Who am I to, especially when I started actively syndicating my own deals, which is, which means pooling investor money together to go buy something bigger and better than I could individually. Mm-hmm. A lot of limiting beliefs, like who am I to do this, right? Um, or, or can I even achieve this? And, um, but I think all those things are, are made up. They're all in our mind, right? There's no reason why, why you can't go out and do what I've done or, or, or what others have done. And, and, you know, a great stepping stone uh, is exactly what I did. So the way that I got introduced to multifamily investing was as a passive investor. So I started investing in other syndications uh, to well, one as, as just an investment strategy, because they're solid returns, but two really with an eye of knowing I wanted to be an active apartment owner one day. And I think this, that would be a great way to kind of understand how the investment works and how the process works. So, so I went out and I invested in 10 syndications uh, with several different operators. um, And I, in 2016 before, you know, with an eye that one day I would do it on my own, but really using it, that as kind of my next level of education. Mm -hmm. How did you uh, go about selecting those syndications? Are there some, uh, lessons learned there, like questions you probably should ask? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah, quite a bit. So I began with uh, just uh, crowdfunding just on on the internet. And I I made my first investments on a crowdfunding site. And uh, one of them went fine. And it was two, one went fine. The other one, I lost all my money. It's still, my money is still in limbo somewhere because these, the sponsor committed fraud and uh, defaulted on his loan. And so the, my money is just, it's in limbo somewhere as all this still gets sorted out years later. Hmm. So uh, questions to ask or approaches to take. I, the problem with just going on the internet and scrolling through deals to find one is that you can't do the due diligence that you really need to do to understand not only the deal, but I think more importantly, the sponsor and who the sponsor is and actually speak with them and understand them and, and, and rate them on things like, you know, integrity and values and mm-hmm. uh, business savvy and experience. And just, so I think I would, I, I would not invest again, and and I have not, without actually speaking to the sponsor and, and at least getting to talk with them, at, le- at least seeing if we have a rapport, um, you know, getting that gut feel. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I think that's a, that was a big lesson learned for me. So the way that I found the the next group of sponsors was largely through podcasts. I started listening to a lot of real estate podcasts. I would hear people on the podcast. If, if I heard something that resonated with me, uh, I'd reach out to them. And, you know, and that was how I found uh, most of them. Sure. Sure. So, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, stood out to me, I, it's no clue, you know, it's no secret here that uh, more times than not, when, when people come on my show, 
the marketing people that uh, are associated with you, they send me over a one sheet, a kind of a little brief description of, of what we, what, uh, what you, what you're about and the podcast and a few other things. But one of the things it's very rare that something like really stands out. And one of the lines from your one sheet says the passive social impact of multifamily investing. And, and I wanted to the positive social impact of multifamily investing. Yes. And that, that really stood out to me because I I've rarely seen that type of phrasing in, in any of this material that sends that sent over. What do you, what is meant by that? Well, I, I think that what we do really does have a positive social impact and, and, and what we do uh, is we, we invest. So we're investing in workforce housing which mm-hmm. is, you know, B and C class multifamily properties, uh, folks with, with an income. And, and this is typical. There are outliers, but typically I'd say folks with, with an income in anywhere from 40 to 60,000, a household income, right. Mm-hmm. Of 40 to 60,000 a year. Um, so typically, you know, typically very blue collar. Right. And, um, and what we do is we purchase these properties and we're fixing them up with the goal of really, creating like clean, modern, affordable housing, and then taking that a step beyond to be able to create communities in these apartments, right? And turn these into communities and create pride of ownership and, and just create a place that the people really want to live. And that, I mean, a lot of the problems that, that folks have, um, their folks can have kind of in those demographics or they just, it's tough to find a good place to live. You know, it's mm-hmm. tough to find a, a clean place to live. It's tough to find a safe place to live. So I take a lot of pride in being able to create those kind of communities um, and, and give people give people access to that. And, and it, you know, it's not completely altruistic. We are, you know, seeking a profit and we're seeking a return for our investors. But I think it it can be a win-win because we're, we're coming in, we're improving people's apartments, you know, we're putting in new appliances, we're creating new amenities. Uh, one thing that we do on our properties is we, we bring in fiber optic internet to all of mm-hmm. our properties. We're, across our entire portfolio, we're wiring the property with fiber optic internet. And we do that for cheaper than any of the, the current providers in the market. And I know that because we do market surveys and we, uh, we very mindfully undercut the market, you know, so we come in, provide a better product for internet, let them not have to do with deal with the cable company. And, uh, and we reduce their overall financial burden by lowering their, their, um, their internet fees, their monthly internet charges. Hmm. But it's a win-win for us because, you know, they were already paying someone for internet. Now they're just paying us for internet. So we shift that revenue to the property but overall, the financial burden of the of the the resident is lower. Mm-hmm. So then, you, uh, no, I was going to say, do you, gonna, do you yeah, bill ahead. them separately then for their internet, or is it some? It's just part of their rent. Uh, it, d- depending on the the, lo- the location, uh, you know, there's different. There can be some different rules, but um, mostly we're billing them separately. Sometimes we do bundle it into the rent and and do it all as a package. Sure. But um, um, yeah, go, you know, I no, was just going to mention, say? I was going to uh, continue to expand on some of the things that, that we're doing that, that, sure. are, that are cool. And some of our more affordable properties were like, we've put in community gardens. Uh, we have a residence assistance program where we offer um, language assistance for folks that have English as a second language. We have like financial literacy programs that we've offered. Uh, we have a, a BH Kids program, BH is Burge and Held, which is the firm, BH Kids program, which uh, gives kids uh, backpacks loaded with school supplies. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just cool things that, that we can do to, to give back. Um, and it, it, it's great because, it, I mean, it's good, it's good for those people and, and, you know, it's good for the overall community, but it's also good for our investors because what we're trying to do is help those people. But in doing that, we're creating a more stable tenant base, right? If we can help people Mm -hmm. with financial literacy and language programs, then we're helping people like hopefully find and maintain jobs. Right. Um, And and also with the gardens, we're creating a sense of community, you know, people don't want to, 
you don't want to trash a community if, if you like it, right? And if you feel a pride of ownership in it. So, you know, I think these things can all be win-wins, but, but I do really think there, there is a, a positive social impact to just creating um, what I call is like clean, affordable housing for America's workforce. Mm-hmm. So how do you go about this today? Like when you, when you identify properties, uh, what are your, some of your requirements there? Uh, as far as what, what are we look for in properties? Yeah. What you look for in properties and how you run those numbers? Yeah. So we, uh, we pretty much are, our bread and butter is going to be class, uh, gar- like suburban garden style multifamily properties, uh, typically built, um, typically built in kind of mid seventies or newer, uh, for the mm-hmm. most part, you know, if we have our preference, we're buying eighties or newer because there was, you know, the, the, those mid seventies were a, uh, you know, tough, tough time in the U S we're in recession. There's, um, you know, building practices kind of slid in some ways, I think. And then in, mm-hmm. even into the eighties, some of the construction requirements, and practices change, change. One of the biggest things being just like PVC pipe, for example, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and, and implementing that, which saves a lot from a drainage standpoint and drainage issues. So try to look at eighties and newer, um, from a unit standpoint, we have a, we have a 30 unit property. We have a 900 and I think 40 unit property. So, you know, we're really looking at the full gamut, but kind of that solid workforce housing, like I described, typical incomes in that kind of 40 to $60,000 range. Um, and we focus a lot on, on, on that. I mean, one of, one of the key pieces of our portfolio is, is looking at the affordability of our rents. And, and really, as we're looking at a property, looking at what that um, rent to income ratio is. So it's a critical thing to look at right now. I mean, especially I think in, in this mm-hmm. COVID environment more than any, but looking at how much of someone's income are they paying each month in rent, right? Mm-hmm. And so HUD tells us that anybody that's paying more than 30% of their income uh, toward rent is rent burdened, meaning uh, you know, really not sustainable. And so we, we try to buy properties that are, that are in the teens or, or low 20s. And even after improving the property and therefore in, in increasing rent, still being well below that 30% mark to make sure that it's still affordable for the folks. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what you, you keep talking about improving these properties, like what are some of those outside of adding the internet? What are some of the other things have you seen that you uh, you've been adding or changing? I know you've talked about the community gardens and helping and doing that uh, social impact. Um, but uh, it yeah. sounds like there must be some actual physical improvements you've, you've found that are pretty common as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's kind of the bread and butter, but you know, the interior and exterior improvements. So on the interior, we are almost universally re- replacing uh, carpet, at least in the main living areas with, uh, with, you know, vinyl plank flooring. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're putting in, you know, what kind of looks and feels like a wood product in there, um, you know, replacing countertops, um, we will replace cabinets. Cabinets are the most expensive thing that you can replace. So we like to, you know, we like to salvage those if they're in good shape. Um, but, you know, lighting, modernizing lighting, um, fa- mm-hmm. you know, faucets and fixtures, hardware on cabinets and things like that. So just making, making the apartment more modern, right? Bringing it up to right. modern day standards. So whether it's a two-tone paint scheme of gray walls with white trim versus like a beige kind of cream from, you know, the nineties, uh, things like that. But our, our sta- standard really, I mean, flooring almost everywhere. Um, and then modernizing light fixtures, painting, um, things like that go a long way. Sure. And then another big thing that we're, we're doing across our portfolio is really the focus on smart technology. So we're putting smart locks in that folks, mm. you know, they can act, they can use their phone to access their lock and, and their unit. Um, people have really liked that. And it also helps us with management efficiencies, be able to control access remotely um, right. to the properties. So that that's another kind of win-win, but this smart technology um, in some of our higher end properties, we're also taking it beyond locks and doing smart thermostats, lighting, blinds, all, all t- kinds of things really give a, a smart home 
feel. Sure. No, you know, the, that remote capabilities is something, I mean, we've even started to explore a little bit because I, uh, I mean, mm-hmm. I've been even showing properties remotely now. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't even have to send anybody there anymore. Yeah. Uh, for, so when you, when you think of some of this stuff that you're talking about, I'm just pointing out that uh, it might sound a little cost prohibitive to some, but when you think about the man hours and sending somebody there for showings and other things, that's, yeah. it, there's really a savings there. No, a hundred percent agree. And, and smart locks are not that expensive. I mean, they're, they can be, they, they, they range the whole gamut, but the one, like the, like the, the workhorse that we put in, in a lot of our properties is, is about a 200 to $250 lock uh, that's mm-hmm. Bluetooth enabled. So it, it communicates to you with your phone via Bluetooth. You walk up, put your phone next to it. It, it opens. You can send people one-time codes um, for showings and examples like that. We actually have a, a full software we use called Tour 24, which is a, a full self-guided tour. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, but there's, there's other, I mean, I know there's other tour models where you don't even need a smart lock. You can just have a, have a lock box that you give people a code to and, and they go and access the lock box, get the key and, and go in. So it doesn't have to be cost prohibitive at all. Sure. So, you know, you're talking about the importance of uh, creating that, that community or that environment. Um, but before we go down that road, I wanted to remind everybody again to head over to your website, Ken, KentRitter.com. That is R-I-T-T-E-R.com. Or uh, definitely subscribe to the podcast, Ritter on Real Estate. Um, with that being said, that one of those things that really intrigues me is, is creating that community. Do you find that doing that it's like a long term, or can you do that in a relatively quick amount of time? You know, I think it, it's something that you're never finished with, but I mm-hmm. think it's something that starts relatively simply and then you can get really creative, but, but you can make a huge impact as a new owner by just coming in and starting with, with outstanding maintenance tickets. So on our properties that we take over, I mean, there's always a backlog of maintenance stuff because the, the owner's sure. selling it and they're like, you know, whatever. So just, just showing the tenants that we're going to come in, we're going to knock those out. We're going to get them taken care of. We're going to take care of you. Like there's a new sheriff in town, right? Like we're, we're if you put a maintenance ticket in, we're going to get it done and we're going to do it right. We're going to be responsive. Like that changes the whole environment. And, and I think like, like, and it's also just smart business too, because the, the problem is like, if you have folks, if, if your residents are trained that, oh, if I put a ticket in for a maintenance request, like they'll get, they're never going to get to it. They don't respond. Then they're mm-hmm. going to stop reporting things. And that's when you're going to end up with issues like a, like a drip under the sink that turns into a giant problem because the resident didn't report it for three months. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so I think that it's, again, it, it's really important, but I think getting in, setting that precedent, I think coming in and making some immediate improvements to the property, especially exterior improvements that everyone can see. So mm-hmm. new signage, new landscaping. Uh, like we just, we just closed on a property uh, th- like a couple of weeks, three weeks ago as, as of this. So or early March. And um you know, one of the first things we're doing is, is we're ha- we had a landscaping crew come out and do all the bushes. It's a lot of bushes, a lot of trees, very wooded property, do all the trees, do all the bushes. We're bringing in, you know, sod and things for to, to replace grass parts and do all this. So just get the landscaping um, improved to just show people that we're putting money into the property and that we care about the property. And I think that that's like step one. That's kind of like, you know, that's like baseline. You've got to do that stuff. And then from there, if you can start doing, you know, events or programs and things, offering services. One thing, one thing that we do, we've negotiated a uh, a cell a cell phone deal with AT and T to to give our residents reduced uh, uh, cell phone bills. Hmm. So it's it's not something that that we um, like directly profit from, but it's something that we're able to offer, and uh, it's just kind of like bulk purchasing, right? But it's right. just little things that we can do. No, that's, that's especially interesting that you've, um, those are little incentives that I guess a lot of us probably 
have never considered uh, negotiating with the cell phone provider just to offer a discount. I mean, that does, there's no cost to you other than a, probably a call or two to see if you can arrange something like that, but it could make a pretty significant impact to uh, one of your renters. Yeah, absolutely. So I think those are things that that could differentiate you and 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 that can help. Um, you know, again, like lower turnover, maintain occupancy, make sure people have pride of ownership and are taking care of the property, which ultimately puts more money back, you know, in your pocket or your investors' pockets as well. Because mm -hmm. um, all the all those things help the deal work. So, yeah, these these win wins, right? I think we keep coming back to that theme or. And um, I think that's, that's what we're trying to create, you know, I'm trying to get creative with it beyond just, just uh, rehabbing the interior. Right. Cause, right. <clears throat> cause from a, from a business standpoint, that's also one of the riskiest things to do because it's the most expensive, mm -hmm. you know, so you're, you're putting this money in hoping for a return. Some of these other things that we're doing, um, they don't require much money at all. Sure. So, you know, uh, going back to something, you know, I always like to uh, wrap things up a little bit with like some actionable things that people could actually do, mm -hmm. you know, if they're getting into multifamily investing for the first time, whether it's an exercise or some best practices, if they're considering doing real estate investing for that first time and, and uh, you know, syndication, you know, getting involved there is always a great passive option. And uh I'm sure that you have those options available through your site. Again, again, it's kentritter.com. But if they were looking at a multifamily property today, like what are some of those things you, you would suggest or recommend that they, they uh, what type of action should they take? Yeah, that that's really good. So I would say if they, if folks are kind of just getting started or interested in it, um, well, you should be, just digesting as many books and podcasts on the subject as, as, as you can. That that's where I started. And that's kind of the first level. Um, you know, from there, if you, if you, if you're like, I really want to do this and you're getting a little more serious, well, it, it becomes a lot about networking at that point. It's about building relationships with brokers, building relationships with property management companies who, who you want to have help you through the due diligence process. You don't want you want to know who your property manager is going to be before you buy the property and you want, you right. want them along with you through the process. Um, and, and then networking, it, if you're not buying on your own, if you're going to pool money together, then networking with other people that you might invest or, or partner with. So that networking is, is critical. Um, and then the other thing I would say is it's really easy nowadays to just get on the broker's list. It's like go on CBRE.com or Cushman Wakefield, you know, all the big ones, get on their deal lists to get deals sent to you and just practice underwriting and just mm -hmm. practice the process of underwriting deals, understanding, you know, what works, what doesn't doing, you know, market rent surveys to know what the competition is doing. Just practicing all those things. Um, cause you've got to do it a lot before you get really good at it. So I think those are some, some immediate tips. Yeah, no. And, and, uh, those are very important tips. And in fact, you know, if you want to learn how to do some of that stuff, I'm going to direct you direct them all to your podcast and website again, because I know you have, you've covered a lot of this far more in detail. And I mean, you're, you're closing in on, on, probably a year or more of content now on your podcast. And, mm -hmm. and uh, there's, I think, I think we host, when we host these real estate investing podcasts, we have kind of a unique group of listeners because we do have people that once they find a good podcast and a new good fit, they go back and consume all of that other, the old content, yeah. because it's, it's training material uh, and that's freely available. So Again, uh, Ritter on real estate and for the podcast or Ken Ritter, KentRitter.com. Yep. And I warned you, I was going to end with one last question. Was there a question you wished I would have asked you today? Yeah. You know, the, the only other thing that I, I feel like I, I wanted to say uh, as you were, as we were talking about things that people should be doing are just like maybe things that people should watch out for if it is mm -hmm. their first time and they're looking at deals. And I mean, the, the two biggest things that are going to burn you from an underwriting standpoint are 
are going to be taxes and insurance because they're both going to be higher than you expect they are. And they're both going to be probably way higher than the broker's telling you they're going to be. Mm -hmm. So just make sure that um, as you're, as you're looking, if you're looking to do it yourself and you're looking at deals that, you know, that's networking again, you need a multifamily insurance broker who can give you real quotes, don't rely on what's in, in the, in the, the offering packages and then understanding, you know, the tax environment you're in, it differs by County. Um, so you've, you've got to do the research to know what, how you purchase that property is going to impact the taxes. Cause in some places it means taxes go up right away in other places. Uh, it may not happen for three, four years. So I, mm -hmm. but those are the two things I think that'll really get you. You know, the, that last one in particular was a, was a hard lesson learned because uh, you're absolutely right. You know, when that, when you're, if you have a, if you're buying one of those multifamilies from an owner who's owned it for a generation or more, right? Um, they're probably paying on the property tax of when they acquired it. And when That's you, right. when you change those hands in depending on the County, uh, yep. it, it can change those property tax numbers significantly. Yeah. I mean, it, it can realistically double or tip double or triple the amount that you're going to owe in taxes. So, well, I hope people listen to the end on this one, because I mean, if, if any lesson was learned, it was probably that that was a pretty significant one. Um, I really appreciate your time, Kent. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, maybe you can be, come back on again and we could actually do like a uh, underwriting 101 where we kind of take a take yeah. a take a multifamily and and just run through the numbers once and and uh, so people have a clear understanding of how this is done yeah jack that's a great idea i'd be happy to do that so we, we could well, walk through one of one of the deals that we've done oh that'd be awesome so well i appreciate it again and uh we'll talk to you soon great well thanks for having me on have a good rest of the day yeah, you too.